Well, welcome everybody today and thanks for joining in to have a listen about sentinel trees but also about canaries and some cheese as well and we'll get to those a bit later on so who am i i'm, I'm matt parrott i'm officially the observatory scientific coordinator and i've got a background largely in silviculture but also some ecology some tree health and that's all within forest research uh, but I've also been working with people like the Field Studies Council for a number of years, Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, and also the Wildlife Trusts, where I've been doing a lot of botanical ID training, in particular tree ID and really specifically conifer ID. And now I'm with Observatory. Uh, my role is really to lead on the planning and delivery of volunteer training. And it's a bit of communication as well, like today. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to talk about the rise of novel tree pests and diseases because this is the problem that we're facing. Uh, we're going to look at how we can monitor for them. We're going to go into the specifics of what are sentinel trees? What does it mean? And then talk about observatory and sentinel trees and then look forwards to how is that data that's being gathered actually going to be useful? So this is a chart which some of you will be familiar with but it's showing the rise really in pest and disease introductions and these are pests and diseases of trees specifically since around 1970 into the UK. So we've got some very familiar names there, things like Dutch elm disease which was one of the earlier ones and things like great spruce bark beetle which came in in 1983. Um, even more recently horse chestnut leaf miner 2002 Oak processionary moth in 2006, oriental chestnut gall wasp in 2015. So it goes on. I mean, each of those dots represents an introduction. So I've just pulled out some of the, the bigger names. And most recently, Phytophthora pluvialis back in 2021. Now, when something comes in to the country, we get this epidemic growth curve, if it's going to become an epidemic, that is. So we start off with the lag phase, and this is where we just get a few of these pockets of disease or pests, and the numbers slowly build. And usually we don't really notice this. What we do notice is the exponential phase when numbers really start to climb and we get a lot of highly visible symptoms. Then eventually we come to this slowdown and decline where things start to reach a bit of an equilibrium maybe. So from our perspective, the really important phase is this lag phase. That's where we need to focus all of our attention. So when it comes to outbreak control, early detection is the key. And that's where looking closely at this lag phase comes in. If we can detect things early, we've got a much better chance of successful eradication. And a good case here is the Asian longhorn beetle outbreak at Paddock Wood in 2012. So that... That was really localised, thankfully, and was subsequently declared successfully eradicated. What if eradication isn't possible? Are there still wins in terms of getting an early look at things? And yeah, there are, because we can do things like maximising the research time. We're buying time to look for some solutions. We can look at ways of minimising impacts. And we can also maybe look at things like development of biocontrols to get on top of things. So the latest estimate I've got is for roughly 3 billion trees in the UK. And that's roughly equivalent for 45 trees for every person. Um, how on earth do we even start to monitor all of those? And here comes the first bit of cheese. So we use an integrated approach and this is known as the Swiss cheese model. So think of a Swiss cheese, Emmental, with holes in. And if we stack these up and then we introduce some pests and diseases, hopefully each slice of cheese will stop some of the pests and diseases so that by the time we get down to the bottom of that stack, there's only a very small number or even no pests and diseases coming through. We've got things like the forest trapping network, uh, which is set up across the UK now. And you may have seen recently in the press reports of a Ips topographist picked up in Scotland as a single beetle, and that was found as part of this forest trapping network. 
We've got things like Tree Alert, the central reporting system for tree pests and diseases in the UK. This is open to all, so we can sometimes pick things up in there that may otherwise have been missed. Then we've got more targeted things like helicopter and drone surveys for things like Phytophthora. Targeted surveys. So this is where we've got a very specific pest that we're interested in finding. So fairly recently, we looked at things like uh, oak lacebug and plain lacebug. Unfortunately, none were found but during the surveys by observatory volunteers. So we're pretty comfortable that one isn't out in the wider environment here. And then we've got sentinel trees as one of those layers as well. So what is a sentinel? So a sentinel is one who watches or guards, and it's specifically a military term for a soldier, set to guard a place from surprise and to observe the approach of danger and give notice of it. Um, I think I prefer a canary. So the canary in a coal mine, giving us a heads up that something's going on that we might want to know about. Taking that a step further, and really, what what is a sentinel tree? So these are trees which are deliberately selected for regular repeated monitoring for signs of ill health. And the key bit there is repeated monitoring. So this is something that happens once. It happens year after year after year. They can give us an early warning system like our canary in the coal mine, that something's not quite right. But they can also tell us more than that, they can tell us how trees are responding to novel pests and diseases over time. So once the disease is here, we can track where it's going. How is it behaving and how are the trees responding to it? So sentinel trees can come in several forms. And the first group are really the expatria sentinel trees. And from a UK perspective, these are trees which are planted in other parts of the world, such as silver birch in the USA for example. And recently, a 20-year study in Ohio was looking at the impacts of bronze birch borer, which is one of our priority pests, on different birch species. Unfortunately, there were silver birch planted out there, and they were all killed by bronze birch borer, but the American native birches survived. So that gave us here in Europe, a heads up that, OK, if bronze birch borer gets here, our native birch species aren't going to be able to cope with it particularly well. So we need to keep an eye on this one. And there was a similar study in China that highlighted seven potential pests of oak and beech. And, and these are oaks and beeches native to the UK. Um, really importantly, those insects were not previously tagged as being pests. So this is this is part of this horizon scanning process and one of the uses of sentinel trees that we're observing elsewhere in the world. What about here in the UK? So we call these in patria sentinel trees. And these are trees in the UK which are monitored regularly for signs of pests and diseases. And we're interested in both natives and non-natives. So any trees and really trees that are anywhere. So they could be in collections or arboreta. That they could be street trees, they could be in parks, they could be in forests and woodland, and they can even be in forestry trial plots like this one down at Westenburg Arboretum, which is part of the reinforced network. Now, these are trials planted up and down the Atlantic seaboard from the Azores to Mull with exactly the same species, exactly the same genetic stock raised in the same nurseries. So these could in future become a really useful resource as sentinel trees. I'm going to introduce observatory at this point. I'm probably preaching to the converted for a lot of you, but observatory was launched in 2013 to establish and operate an early warning system for tree pests and diseases using citizen science. And this was triggered in large part by the advent of ash dieback in the UK and the impact that had in, in a really short space of time. It's a partnership led by Forest Research, but across the bottom of the screen there, you've got a really good look at all the other people involved. Uh, a lead partner is the Woodland Trust. And the Woodland Trust looks after the volunteer management and helps out with the training as well. As I said earlier, early detection is key. If we can capture things in that lag phase, we've got a much better chance of dealing with them. So a big part of observatory really is to raise awareness and increase 
eyes on the ground to get people out there looking for these things. And we have around 200 volunteers across the UK and they're trained to spot tree pests and diseases, particularly ones that we've decided are priorities. Uh, there's 20 or so of these at the moment, and that focuses attention down to ones we think are a real problem. And importantly, they're fairly easy to recognise in the field. What do the volunteers do? Quite a range of things. So they'll do some general health surveys. So they'll go out to a woodland or a hedgerow, a canal towpath, a park, and they'll look at the trees and they'll, are they doing okay? Are they healthy? Are they unhealthy? If they're unhealthy, what's going on with them? Really importantly, healthy tree reports. So it's all very well knowing when something's sick, but it is just as important that we know when things aren't sick, because this tells us the trees there aren't under any threat at that moment in time. And potentially where a disease hasn't got to yet. A dot on a map doesn't mean it's not there. It means it hasn't been recorded there. They also carry out some really important targeted surveys for things like orange chestnut gall wasp. So this was first found in 2015 in Kent um, by an amateur entomologist. And very quickly, volunteers were mobilised. And the second occurrence was found in St Albans by an observatory volunteer near a bus stop. So that very quickly told us this pest was more widespread than just in Kent. What's the process? behind sentinel trees and how do the observatory volunteers do that and how can other people do it as well so there's a bit of a cycle and we're going to call this the sentinel tree cycle and the first step is registration so it's an important set of information which we need people to gather this will be things like what is the species so let's say horse chestnut is it recently planted yes no don't know if it's recently planted and it's got a problem, we might be able to backtrack it through its suppliers and potentially look for other sites if there's a disease. How old is it? Um, we're going to say this one's mature. And we like to get an idea of the stem diameter as well in a group of classes, so greater than 30 centimetres. What's the habitat like? Where is the tree growing? A park? Is it a woodland? Is it on a garden edge? Really important the location and we ask for a 10 figure grid reference. It's no good having a sentinel tree if you can't go back to the exact tree and get a look at it. Landowner details, these aren't critical, but for example, if we need a sample to be taken from the tree in future, we need landowner permission to do that. It's really important that we have that information if we can. We're going to say this is local authority. And this is another really good thing because Digital cameras now, especially on phones, are so good at capturing imagery. We ask volunteers to get at least two photos of the sentinel tree. And this is all a, a benchmark, if you like. So we've got two photos. Once we've registered the tree, we can start having a look at it in terms of pests and diseases and general health. So is it healthy? Great. If it's healthy, are there, is there anything like any crown loss or transparency? But can we look around the tree and see things like groundworks or is there some evidence of flooding or maybe there's been a fire nearby? Any of these abiotic factors are just as important as pests and diseases. If there is a pest or disease present and an abiotic factor which is causing obvious damage, then we need to know that as well. Now, all of this information from observatory volunteers goes into the tree alert website so it's all handled centrally and in a standard way both of those things are important so we've had our first visit and now we can start going back to the tree again and again and build up this long-term picture so revisiting and we recommend if possible that this is done three times a year so once in the spring once in the summer and once in the autumn. And on each occasion, we're asking the volunteers to compare the current status just with the previous visit. So how has it changed, if it's changed at all? And we then start assigning some categories to that. So is it healthy? Is it stable? Has the condition improved um, or has it declined? 
date, really important. When's this happened in the sequence? And again, we'll start looking at things like crown loss, crown transparency, and any general comments on abiotic, abiotic factors and the like. Is there a new pest and disease? Is the tree dead? Um, either way, that information feeds in to Trailer again. So this concept was introduced into observatory in 2017. And here's a map of sentinel trees. Now, each pin doesn't necessarily represent one tree. There are many trees under quite a lot of those pins, especially around the London area. And so far, we've had over a thousand sentinel trees registered. Now, not all of those are currently active because at the moment, when a volunteer leaves the project, those trees go inactive. But we're looking at ways of potentially in the future asking new volunteers or others to adopt trees so that we don't lose that chunk of data. So just over a thousand trees and so far we've had over 9,700 visits to those trees and out of everything we've got we've currently got 177 trees that have more than five years of consecutive data with them. That's something that's just going to grow so just to put that into some sort of perspective, so the blue lines we're looking at here show the cumulative number of observatory sentinel tree visits since 2017. So let's say in all those years, we've had 9,712 visits. And I ought to also say that this is for trees that were still active in early September 2023. So I'm not looking at inactive trees here. The number of visits each year is the orange or gold box. And you'll notice that that goes up and down a bit, particularly 2020, 2021. Uh, there's no prizes for guessing why that was the case then. Good old COVID slowed things down a little bit. And that is shown as well in the green bars. And those are the numbers of sentinel trees that were actually visited in any one year. So again, there was a bit of a dip 20 to 21. Things have started to pick up in 22. Now 23, that data is incomplete because this is just taken from an early September scrape of the database. We're expecting those numbers to go up. What species are in that mix? Well, far and away, the most common are those which have priority pests or diseases associated with them. Um, and those are actually the ones we asked our volunteers to focus their efforts on initially. So things like peduncular oak with sudden oak death, sweet chestnut with sweet chestnut blight and oriental chestnut gall wasp, ash with ash dieback. Um, sycamore was a bit of an odd one. That doesn't have a priority pest or pathogen associated with it, but it's a nice common tree. Um, so there's quite a spread there, but then we've also got some other species creeping in. So things like cherry and Douglas fir, um, and also plain lime. So there's a few odd things. We've got a good spread, but the focus is on those priority pests and pathogens and their hosts. Let's look at an example of a sentinel tree. So this is Circ 01, an ash. And we've got a tree ID there. Uh, we've got some landowner details. It's a mature tree. It's recently planted. No. It's a mature tree. It would be very odd if that was the case, although it does happen. It's more than 30 centimetres. We've got the habitat listed as other, so it doesn't fit clearly into one of the categories. And we've got a good grid, for, grid reference there as well. So what does that information actually look like? So across the years this tree has been monitored, we can see the number of visits has stayed more or less stable, unlike the condition of the tree, because that's started to decline. It's stabilised. And then it's dead or removed, but then it's healthy again. So something a bit unusual is happening here. So we need to dig a bit deeper. And we can see that in 2017, Clara was present. And in between that, we've got nothing new identified. But then Clara pops up again in 2023. So what's what's happening here? We have a good photo record for this tree. So here it is when it was first visited in 2017. And note that these pictures 
run through the seasons. So we've got that nice spread of multiple visits in the year, not just in the summer, not just in the spring. In January, unsurprisingly, no leaves. And in June, it's looking very lush and healthy there. In May 2022, something has happened. The tree has gone. And we don't know why it was felled, um, probably because it was overhanging a footpath, we think. Um, but in 2023, it re-sprouted. It had some signs of ash dieback. So that's where we've got that apparent Lazarus effect. Then we've got Kalara coming back in. And on the most recent visit, oh, it's doing pretty well. It's looking quite lush and healthy there. So it's a really nice little record that's starting to build up for that particular ash tree. And that's replicated across all of our data. So this chart shows you the number of years of consecutive monitoring running from seven down to one and the number of trees we've got in each category. So at the moment we have 15 trees which have got that full seven years of records. But as we follow through this project, that data set is going to grow. I mean, we've got 474 trees plus all those others with one year of monitoring. So we've got a potentially impressive data set developing here. And going back to our little um, end pandemic chart, I could even say maybe we're starting to move out of our own lag phase and we're starting to accelerate here. We're getting more and more records coming in. So importantly, how is this data going to be used? So we could look at things like how is a pest or disease spreading or when does it arrive in an area? So this is horse chestnut leaf miner. And the chart shows records purely on the Tree Health Diagnostic Advisory Service um, database. So not all of these are sentinels, but some of them are. And you can see that early on it was confined largely to the southeast, but it has gradually spread northwards. So early records from 2007 are blue and then we're heading through to red. And most recently we've got this record up near Inverness from one of our volunteers. And that's the furthest north it's been recorded to date. So this is a really useful way of saying, where are we with horse chestnut leaf miner? Where is it in the country? Another thing we can look at, and this is from Scottish Forestry's tree health team, um, and they're looking at how individual trees respond. In this case, ash to ash dieback. It's down the left hand side here. We've got the individual tree IDs and then we've got them broken into years and the dots represent the condition that's been assigned to them. So are they improving? It's only one tree that does that. Are they healthy across those four, three, four years? Are they healthy? Are they stable? Or is some, some, there some decline going on? So Paul and his ash tree number five up here, it's been healthy right the way through. So that's interesting. Um, we don't know where that one is without looking at the details. It could be over on the Outer Hebrides, so the disease hasn't really got to it yet. But maybe it's somewhere where there is a lot of disease and it's survived and maintained a healthy habit. Or there's this one here um, where it's been stable for a while, but then it's gone into decline in 2022. So once we've got that sort of data and the, the more it grows, you can start looking into things like, are there any common factors? With trees that re retain a healthy condition? Are they growing in particular sites that are maybe drier or wetter, particular soil types? So we can start looking for things that might tell us how we can manage the disease. This is quite an exciting potential. So remote sensing, and it's, this is an active and ongoing area of research. So we're looking at using satellite or more likely drone imagery and analysing the wavelengths of reflected light from foliage to see whether they're changing in response to a disease or a pest infestation. Now, if we can do that, we can upscale that and look at much bigger areas much more quickly and more cost effectively. But to do that, we need to get some ground truthing first and the sentinel tree data is potentially really important here because we've got a photographic record thanks to Google Maps in this case going back. Um, remember the ash tree we looked at that had been felled in the May? We can spot that ash tree and pick out the foliage from it and we can start looking at how the light reflected from that tree changed 
as any disease was detected. And again, if we can upscale this, it gives us the potential to scan big areas cost effectively and have another layer in our cheese stack for looking at pests and diseases and where they are. So a quick summary, we had a problem and that's the rise in the novel tree pests and diseases. We've got some cheese and that's this stack of integrated monitoring levels. So hopefully nothing gets through all of them. If we put enough levels in there, none of them are perfect on their own, but together they're a really powerful way of monitoring. We've got a canary sentinel trees either here in the UK or overseas with those birch trees we saw in Ohio and the bronze birch borer. We've got the process, select a tree, record the observations, revisit and repeat in a standardised way. And the end result is a growing data set that is becoming more powerful as it does so. So thank you very much.